Hello, everybody. Welcome to Safety First is Murphy's Law. And today we have a really special guest. Um, and before we introduce our guest, I'd like to say welcome to Soul Sister Radio. This is Tracy Murphy and my co-host, Star Myers. Star, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Very glad to be here. Excited about our guest tonight. I know, I know, me too, and, and I've been learning. You've known her a lot longer than I have, um, but I'm learning about, about the work that she's doing, and it's, it's something that, that um, needs to be out there, you know, let people know that, that there's, there's hope and, and they don't have to battle um, survival from these, these types of traumas by themselves. Um, do, would you like to introduce our, our guest tonight? Um, yes, tonight we have um, sexual abuse recovery coach Rachel Grant. Rachel, are you there? I'm here. Hey, Rachel. How, How are, are you everybody? tonight? I'm Thank doing you well. For coming. Thank you for coming tonight. Oh, my pleasure. This is, this is really great. We have our show, uh, Safety First is Murphy's Law, it is a new show. We, we just started maybe two months ago. And we created this show in honor of Susan Murphy Milano. And um, she created um, a tool called the Evidentiary Abuse Affidavit um, from her book called Time's Up. Mm -hmm. And this, this book saved my life. And, and all the work that she does out there for everybody else um, I can honestly say I'm a true testament. I, I lived it, I experienced it, I got out of it, and I've been in recovery from it since. But thanks to, to the education and knowledge um, that I've learned from, from Susan, I want to be able to pr um, give it to other people and share it with other people. And so that's where Star and I have come together and created this show. And we like to bring on experts and specialists that can provide education for people and, and help them through their process. Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so tell me about you. Tell, tell us about what you do. Um, you're the founder of, of a, a coaching business for, for sexual abuse recovery. That's, that's right. That's, uh, not not uh, the norm out there. It's not um, <laughs> there aren't many of us out there working uh, around sexual abuse in this way. Um, but uh, yeah, so I started Rachel Grant Coaching and developed my program from Broken to Beyond Surviving, starting about uh, in 2007. And uh, I, I wonder where I should begin. Um, <laughs> where should I start the story? Well, well, let's see. You, you started about seven years ago, and um, w would you like to, to talk about where the passion came from, or would you like to talk about what you do now? Um, it's up to you. Sure. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, just share a little bit about uh, my story so folks kind of know how this all came to be, you know, what I'm, I'm kind of up to in, in life these days. So I uh, grew up in a small town in Oklahoma and was the youngest of three kids and was living with my mother and my father and my, my grandfather. And I had just, a, you know, a fairly... A normal childhood. We were kind of in the middle between country and suburbish and kind of environment, but there was a huge park across the way, and it was one of those towns where I really could just walk out and, and go play and, and run around and, and not really worry about much happening. Mm -hmm. And there was lots of space, lots of freedom um, to roam about. And my grandfather was quite a bit older, and uh, we didn't spend too much time together, but I remember him being kind of this warm, uh, friendly guy who was in the house, and I spent a lot of time kind of uh, almost uh, like a caretaker. You know, I'd, I'd take mm -hmm. him his cereal, and I would help my mom out sometimes if she was busy and needed him, if he needed something, and we would just sit together sometimes and watch TV and tell stories, and Oftentimes, we'd go out and sit on the porch together and spend time that way. 
And he was just kind of this warm, quiet companion uh, until the day that he started abusing me when I was 10 years old. Interesting. I was going to ask you the question of when this happened, had you been already feeling any feelings like he was going to push any limits with you, or, or did it just kind of come out of the blue? Yeah, it was certainly out of the blue, and, and so often that's well, the way abuse is. Yeah. And, and um, so that must have been really frightening. It was very. You know, the first time that it happened, I um, was fairly frozen in the moment, and when I finally kind of got up and, and got away, uh, I just remember going uh, back into my parents' room and was there crying and scared and, and very upset and didn't know what to do next, uh, oh didn't God. know how to how to respond, and, you know, this is something that, you know, th this particular experience of, you know, when, when abuse starts and we're young, and we don't know how to handle it. We don't know what language to even use sometimes to describe what's happening to us. It is a moment when we often begin feeling very alone um, in the world. And for me, that certainly became uh, a sense and a way of being that stuck with me for a very long time. And Eventually, when my parents did discover what was happening, uh, they were they were great in the sense that they got my grandfather out of the house. They were very supportive of me, but they were also a little unsure of how to really what to do next. You know, how to really help me through understanding what had happened, healing from what had happened, and so it kind of became this experience that yes, it was there, and we all knew about it, but we didn't really spend much time talking about it. Um, so a lot of my teens were spent making lots of bad choices and uh, chasing around, feeling very insecure, uh, doubting my worth and my value, and um, struggling to really be feel like I was accepted and okay. And um, by the time I got to my 20s and was you know, starting to have a more serious relationship, you know, other problems started to show up. I had a very hard time trusting. I was very suspicious. Um, I also made, again, a very bad choice in a partner and ended up with somebody who was abusive. And so after years, you know, I started realizing, okay, this experience has had an impact on me. It's not going to just go away. And as much as I wanted to just put it in the corner, forget about it, pretend that it wasn't there, I had to. I came to the place where I realized, you know, no, I have to. I have to look at this. I have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That that's quite courageous on that part too to even be able to go that deep within yourself to become aware of that and say, hey, I got to do something about this. Right. Yeah. And I think most of us who've been abused, we, we usually hit that place. And then what can be frustrating, certainly what was frustrating for me, was that despite going to um, therapists and reading books and joining groups, I was starting to get some understanding about why I was making some of the choices I was making and, and what I was doing. But every time I got to the, the place of wanting to know, okay, well, that's great, but what do I now do about it? How do I actually get out of this pattern? How do I actually change this behavior? Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting any good answers. And I just kept going around the same mountain over and over and over again. And when that, when that re when I was about 28, um, that relationship ended. And I had this moment where I was looking at my life and thinking, God, I have just been surviving all these years. I've just been, it's been a constant struggle. I've its always felt like a burden. I'm always feeling miserable or I have a good day, but then I'm back in it. And something's got to give. There has to be a better way to deal with this problem. There has to be an answer to, you know, what do I do about it? Well, you know, so, that's really interesting. I bet you there are so many people with that feeling right now. 
living absolutely. with that right now. Absolutely. And I, I talked to people and I, you know, other people who I knew, uh, yeah, they were struggling too. So it really kind of lit a fire under me, quite honestly. And I, I set out I to to try to figure out the answer to this. And so I started reading everything I could. I started studying neuroscience. I completed my master's in counseling psychology. And I also just started paying really close attention to what was working for me, what ideas, patterns, habits, choices, um, insights were I having that was making a difference. And so all of it eventually came together and is the program that I now um, offer for survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Beautiful. Oh, my gosh. And, and so now what I've seen is you have the different segments, um, like different blogs that, where you talk about um, the, like eating disorders. And, that you know, it sounds to me like with not dealing with or coping with or grieving or what it is that we need to work through, certain um, symptoms occur, such as addictions or, or things like that. Is, is, would that be fair to say? Absolutely, yeah. And so, you know, what I often do as a kind of a free resource on my website is, um, you know, I link to my blog and I'm constantly bringing on guest bloggers who are either telling their story and what they did to recover or bringing on people who are talking about um, how abuse impacts other areas of life such as sexuality or our relationship to food and in fact just started a series this past week on the relationship of trauma and disorder eating and that will be continuing you know for the next two weeks so the blog is a great place for people to go and and certainly read about a variety of topics and um, dig all the way back in the archives. There's so much material there. Um, I've been really um, blessed to have people um, come on come on as guest bloggers and share their stories and perspectives, and um, we'll continue doing that. We'll have a series coming up soon um, about um, bullying, actually, and how, you know, we become, you know, when, when there's abuse, how that sets us up in many ways to be have a hard time standing up for ourselves and setting boundaries and can be very vulnerable to being attacked. Oh, that's, now, that's fabulous. Go ahead, Sarah. Now, now Rachel, um, I asked you a question, but obviously um, you guys didn't hear me because I was muted <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, they ignored me. Um, but. Oh, uh, I was. My microphone yet. was muted. Um, oh. Now back to. Now back to. I was asking. Um, what What were some of the things that you did say that worked for you that you um, put into your program? Oh sure. Well, so what What I very first began to understand through studying the brain in neuroscience is the impact that trauma has on on the brain. And so one of the very, where we start in the program, um, From Broken to Beyond Surviving is an eight-month program, um, and I deliver it either by phone or by Skype, so have been able to work with people all over the country and even internationally. And where we start is the foundation, and that is understanding that the brain is wired a very particular way because of abuse, and all of the choices that we make in life, of course, are preceded by a thought, right? They're preceded by something going on in the brain. <clears throat> and so one of the things that made a big change for me was just simply getting that a lot of that was what was going on for me wasn't this insurmountable problem. It wasn't this airy, kind of effervescent, I can't get my hands wrapped around it to figure out what's happening Thing, it was actually a very clear biological pattern. And my brain was actually doing what it was supposed to do in many ways. It was creating patterns and coping skills and uh, to help me in order to deal with the experiences. So just by way of an example, whenever we have an experience, our, our uh, tendency and the way that we are programmed is to try to interpret and understand why that's happening. 
And this is a good skill to have. We need to have this skill so that we can get on in the world. Right. The problem is that when it's something traumatic, our tendency is to always go towards something negative and also to make it about ourselves. So for example, when I, when I ran to my parents' room and I was there and I was all alone and I was crying and nobody was coming to check on me, uh -huh. in that moment, my explanation, my understanding of why that happened was like, oh, I must be on my own. Like, nobody's here for me. This is my problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and, and because of the way the brain works, I ignore the fact that, you know, my mom is, you know, 100 yards away in another part of the room, doesn't, house and doesn't even hear me, or she's, out, she's not even there, my dad's not even home. You know, these sorts of things, we just we forget that sort of stuff, and we go straight into... That. So what happens is the brain, there's actually the, a neuronal connection that happens in the brain. And so as we continue in life, whenever we have experiences that are similar, that same pathway just lights up mm -hmm. and causes us to feel and think the same thing. Right. And so we start responding to situations over and over again out of these old habits, these old thoughts. And so just beginning to understand that. Like, just wrapping my head around that and going, oh, my gosh, like, this is something that is, first of all, normal. It's mm -hmm. what, you know, it actually was very helpful and useful to help me survive. But now I can actually do something about it. I can actually begin to intercept those thoughts and change them and move in a different direction. And as a result, then my choices, my behavior, my experiences also change. Wow, that is a beautiful explanation about the brain and, and the pathway. Because um, we have the Daniel Amen, Amen Clinic out here, and so he, he speaks all over the place, and, and he talks about that, and he talks about the, the, the routine and the neurotransmitters that our brain works off of patterns and, and, and routines. So if there is a traumatic event, our brain is going to continuously go to that traumatic event, no matter how minimal or major the trauma may be later, it's going to because that's all it knows. And that's so right. It is. That's right. So yeah. it's up to us to change those patterns, but knowing mm -hmm. how is the problem that people run into because we, we're not given a tool book. We're not given that the manual of how to get through right. or how to um, change our, our thoughts, like you're saying. This, this yeah, is and one of the one of the downfalls of therapy when it comes to dealing with sexual abuse in lots of areas, um, you know, uh, therapy is extremely helpful to go back and talk about and revisit and re-experience. But when it comes to sexual abuse, it's a very negative um, thing to do like, no. because it reinforces those patterns and reinforces those stories. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is, is kind of the three stages of recovery and that when you're at the beginning stages in kind of the victim stage, you're somebody who hasn't really been able to talk about the abuse. You might not even really acknowledge or, or talk about yourself as somebody who's been abused, right? And you know, when you're in that stage, it's all about beginning to just get comfortable with the fact that this is a part of what happened to you. And once you're there, you can then move into the next stage, which is what I call the survivor stage, which is where you do start talking about. Therapy is extremely helpful at this place because you get a chance to talk about what happened to you without having to challenge it, without having to do anything about it just yet. Just getting comfortable with being able to talk about it out loud, be okay, begin to draw some of those connections and understand it. But for me, what I noticed was I was getting stuck at that survivor stage, and a lot of people around me were getting stuck at that survivor stage, were just constantly rehashing it and talking about it and dealing with it and not getting past it. So that's when I decided, okay, we're the third stage. Through. <laughs> say that again? I was going to say that's just reinforcing those pathways. Yes, exactly. Yes. And so that's where I kind of decided, all right, there, there must be a next stage. And I'm going to, you know, I kind of coined this phrase and trademarked this phrase beyond surviving 
to represent the kind of what's next, which is when the patterns and the pathways are weakened. They're never ever completely gone, but you can think of it like a pathway that if you if you stop treading it a lot, then you know, like the grass grows back, you know? Mm -hmm. So the pathway's still there, and if you start walking that pathway again, it's gonna come right back where it was. But um, you don't experience the, the triggers as often or as frequently, and more importantly, you have the skills and the tools for how to handle it when they do come up. And that, I, you know, that's a huge part of the program, is just simply teaching communication skills, relationship skills, self-respect skills, all of those sorts of things, so that when situations come up in our lives, we know how to respond. Right. Absolutely. Oh, that's beautiful. And and, and so so the, the coaching aspect of it is, is really very empowering and it and it gives it gives that person the ability to find within themselves that they can make those changes. Um, instead of like you said in the therapy where you're rehashing, maybe it's a more um, uh, optimistic way of, of looking at your life because like you just said it happened you can't change the past but you can change how, how you feel about the past that's right yeah and therapy is plays a, an important part in every journey but when you if you find yourself at that moment where you're like okay I'm sick of this like essentially, you know, I'm I'm working with those people who are just beyond sick and tired of feeling, you know, broken, burdened, unfixable, and are they ready to let go of the pain of abuse and finally feel normal? And you know, want to want to experience, you know, the, their their genuine selves. I often describe, you know, my journey was so much about it wasn't in, in some ways it was learning new things, but in other ways it was pulling away all of the layers of junk that had been put on to me because of abuse mm -hmm. and just letting my real self start to come out again and to show up. Yeah, there you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, lady, you know, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Rachel. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, it's really amazing to me to watch the distinction between coaching and, and therapy because, and one of the reasons why I chose coaching was because I wanted to be able to use my story in a way that you just can't when you're a licensed therapist. And I also wanted to work with people in a more collaborative way. I wanted it to be, you know, uh, driven by, you know, what they're up to and what their needs are. And, you know, we use my guidebook as, you know, kind of a foundation and a, and a resource, and but walking through this journey and then being able to come together and you know be on the phone, be on Skype with each other, and talk about what's showing up for them, and then be able to get under why that's happening in a very short amount of time, and then most importantly, getting them into action. That was a huge piece for me when I was developing from broken to beyond surviving. I knew I wanted it to be measurable. I wanted people to be able to come in and say, this is what I want, and walk out saying, this is what I got, and be happy with that. So, um, you know, that for, for people who maybe don't know the, you know much about what coaching is like, you know, I just want to make that distinction a little bit. It's, you know, it's very future focused. It's about what's happening right now, but how we can shift that and change that and get you on to, you know, whatever's next for you in your life. Yeah, because I think that's probably the biggest problem is breaking free from it after you do survive. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, we don't want to stay stuck in it. And uh, sometimes it can feel, I mean, I certainly remember feeling that way myself, like was there going to be another side to this story? And I had a very hard time picturing what it was going to even look like because I had spent, you know, 18 years of my life feeling uh, not great, feeling like I didn't deserve to be loved, feeling that um, I was not very valuable, being very, very afraid to connect with other people. And, you know, for me, I, I think one of the things that I cherish the most about this work is 
you know, I'm not a uh, perfect person. I still have my days. But w one of the things that I get to do is to model and to let people know that it's possible, that you can reach this place where you're not feeling hurt all of the time and you do know how to, how to cope and how to, how to handle your life, you know, and all the lessons that we sometimes miss as a result of being abused that, you know, we can learn them later. I remember when I was 28, I had this moment where I thought, oh my gosh, I am about emotionally, as emotionally mature as a 12-year-old. I'm great in all these other areas, you know, I can handle work and I take, you know, I do great at school, but when it comes to emotions, I'm still a baby. But I learned, you know, and we can all learn. Whatever area in our lives where we're feeling, you know, kind of stuck or broken or confused, you know, it's, it's definitely possible for us to, to get the skills that we need and, and to move on and have a better life. That brings up a great question. Do you think, like, for a teenager um, that's gotten out of it, that they maybe revert back to, like, you know, seven? <laughs> if they were, mm -hmm. like, 15? Yeah, because I, I know a girl who was, and she, um, yeah, has reverted back to acting like a seven-year-old and being all goofy giddy. And, uh, so that's probably a normal thing. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and, and in some ways, you know, I, and when I'm in my 30s, I sometimes act like I'm in my 20s. You know, we do, we do this. Regardless of whether abuse is there or not, we sometimes revert back to old patterns because they're, they feel more comfortable. They're what we're used to. Uh, you know, one of the things that I experienced, and I, I certainly hear a lot of my clients talk about, is the strange fear that there is of, well, if I take away all of this stuff, if I actually do cut out these patterns and I don't have this drama or I don't have this chaos or I'm not, you know, constantly feeling upset or sad, like, what's that actually going to look like? And sometimes that can be scarier than what you're dealing with right now, you know? Yes. And so, I, yeah, can you relate to that? Yes, absolutely, because um, I was fighting for my daughter who was being sexually abused and, and at, mm -hmm. when it was getting close to an end point, everyone was like, uh, what will you look like after this is done? And Because I spent 12 years fighting, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know. And I was kind of right. lost. Like I was missing something afterward. Something was gone. And at first it wasn't a, it wasn't a happy gone, like I should be all happy and excited because she's finally saved. But it was like, okay, something's missing. Like when yeah. a loved one goes away kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. There's this experience of, you know, almost a blank slate, or sometimes I, I think of it as, you know, we have this blank canvas in front of us, and sometimes a blank canvas can feel intimidating, right? And uh, we can harbor all sorts of fears that we're going to make the same mistakes again, uh, go down the same paths. But on the other hand, if we can reframe it a little bit and if we can set it up as a bit more about being curious or an adventure or trying on a choice today and seeing how that feels, and if it doesn't feel good, you can actually choose differently the next day so that it's a uh, – um, do you remember like the etch -a sketches where you could draw and draw and yes. then you just shook it and it was like a brand new page? <laughs> you know, so often right. we, we fall into the trap of thinking that life is, um, it's this permanent set in stone thing. That if I choose this, this is the way it's going to be and it's going to have to be that way. So we avoid choosing, we avoid changing, we avoid trying things on that, that sometimes don't feel exactly right or comfortable, especially because they're new. But when we start to allow ourselves to embrace life as more like the etch sketch model where I can actually draw something today and I can see what it looks like, I can see how I feel being that, and if I like it, I can keep it, and if I don't, I can just shake it up and try something else the next time. Right, right. I like that. I like that. And sometimes maybe the, the encouragement to let you know that, that it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what if, what advice would you give to somebody who's out there listening now that's that's in that stage? What would you tell them besides that, to, uh, how to deal with that? In in which state? In the the scared to move forward. I know I need to change, but I'm not sure if I if I can. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, you know, often the, the biggest uh, and scariest step is just the asking for support step and finding the right type of support um, for you, whether it's working with a coach like me or some other professional or attending a group. You know, may, taking one little step forward each day um, is, is how you're going to get to the end of your journey. And understanding that you don't have to do it all in one day. You don't have to say, I'm going to fix everything. You don't even have to say, I'm going to give up everything that's not working. You can hold on to some of that stuff for a while while you focus on one other little thing. So I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is sometimes recovery feels like this, well, my relationships are terrible, and you know, I keep fighting with my boyfriend or girlfriend, and uh, I'm not doing very, very well with money because my fight, you know, I can't go to work because I'm sad or I'm having PTSD or I'm having panic attacks. and. Oh, my kids are driving me crazy. You know, it starts to feel like this big, huge, everything is wrong thing. And so it can paralyze us. And we can start to feel like I, I, I can't handle anything and I don't know what to do, so I'm just not going to do anything, right? So I would really encourage people to just take a look at, you know, one small area, one small place in their life where they can take on, uh, you know, changing and transforming it. You know, when I do when I do the, the program with my clients, I spent a lot of time thinking about the sequence of when we would deal with what problem. Most of the time, a lot of times clients come to me because they are having troubles in their relationship. You know, the abuse is impairing their ability to trust. They're so afraid of being abandoned, certainly something I can relate to and, and have felt, that that's the thing that they come in the door with. But what we actually have to do is, is lay some foundational work and get some other things in place so that when we then take a look at your relationship, you're in a good place to do that, right? So, you know, sometimes don't even, the point of that is don't even try to fix the problem that you think is the problem necessarily. Take a step back and look at, you know, how are you how are you thinking about yourself? How are you thinking about your situation? You know, what's going on in your thought life? The mind is so extremely powerful. And um, you know, I have to be careful because I'm not talking about things like, you know, just be positive and everything will be okay. You know, that that kind of thinking can actually lead to more damage. But by being able to detach and separate yourself from the thoughts that you're having and from what's actually really going on is a very powerful first step that you can take when you can begin to recognize that those thoughts that are stirring everything up for you are just thoughts. They're not a truth. They don't have any substance. They don't have any power. They're just there. Interesting. Wow. Well, but they would have power if you allow them to, but understanding yeah. that you can't allow them. Or yeah, you do you guys want to do a quick exercise that I do with my clients just to illustrate the sure. point? Sure. Yeah, okay, and everybody, everybody listening can, can play along too. So what I want you to, what I want you to do is to, to think a thought that you've been having about something that, um, you know, causes you a bit of fear causes you a bit of worry. And I want you to just kind of let that thought come up. And then I want you to start thinking about how you just, you know, it's an I can't statement. Okay, like I can't get better. I can't change my relationship. I can't, you know, make money. I can't get this job. Okay. Those thoughts feel really, really true, right? Like they're, they're they like, that's, that's really the truth. That's really what the circumstance is. So now what I want you to think instead is I want you to start thinking, I can't raise my hand. I can't, there's no way, there's no way that I can lift up my hand and wave. If I lift up my hand and wave, bad things are going to happen. I might not be okay. It's very unsafe to do that. It's a problem. Are you starting to have those thoughts? Mm -hmm. Okay, so keep thinking there's no way, there's no way at all that I can possibly wave my hand and wave. And I want you to pretend I'm sitting across from you, and I want you to lift up your hand and start waving while you're still thinking there's no way that I can wave. 
Are you waving at me? Well, you're a little hesitant. Say that again? I, I feel it makes me feel hesitant to lift my uh -huh. hand. Okay, so you're hesitating. But can you go ahead and raise your hand for me and go ahead and, and uh -huh. wave at me across the table? So you're doing yeah. it, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. So there was some fear, there was some worry, but you actually, your thought actually could not stop your hand from raising. That's right. So the only time that thoughts have power over us is when we latch on to them as something that's really, really true about us. But as, as we just saw, thoughts are just, all that's happening is the brain is just kicking off neural pathways. That's all that's going on. It's just energy. It's not a truth. It doesn't have to be there. And you can act and you can make choices independent of your thoughts. So you can be really, really scared to go to that party and ask that girl out. Or you can be really, really scared to be intimate with your husband. But you can start to make some choices and let the thought just be there, let it fade into the background, challenge it, and go ahead and make some choices. And when you actually get out there and you start asking the girl out and you get positive responses or you have an intimate moment with your husband and you enjoy it, then those behaviors start teaching you new things about what's really true and what can really be possible in your life. Actually creating new neural pathways. That's right. And then you create more of those pathways and the easier those thoughts become. That's right. You got it. That's right. The oh. only reason why the thoughts, I can't, I'm not, I'm terrible, are so quick and we're so quick to go to them is one, the brain is just wired that way. The, the brain is, it goes to the negative first because it's a survival technique. Sure. But it also goes there just because that's what you've been practicing. Anything that you practice, you're going to get good at. That's and right. so if you practice all of these negative things about who you are and what your options are and how things are going to go, how things are going to turn out, you're going to be very, very good at that. But similarly, if you begin practicing other techniques, other skills, you shift your focus to other things, you get strong in other ways and you become skilled at that instead. Do you find, do you find affirmations helpful? I'm, I'm a post-it person. <laughs> yeah. After, <laughs> you know, affirmations are so interesting. They're, they're getting a lot of flack in pop psychology and in the world of psychology these days. And I actually uh -huh. use what I call declarations. Mm -hmm. um, so it, here's the important distinction. Saying an affirmation like, I am beautiful, mm -hmm. it is a temporary fix. It can make you feel warm and fuzzy. It can help shift your focus momentarily. But the brain is going to go back to wherever it goes back to whenever there's stress or difficulty or you're low on energy, or you haven't eaten enough. So the reason why I use the word declaration is because it's about declaring and claiming something for yourself as opposed to kind of a wishful thinking. And when we declare and claim something for ourselves, we have to back it up with choices and behavior. And more importantly, it's not just about warm, fuzzy feelings. It's about literally changing the way the brain is wired, right? So when we start with language, which is extremely powerful, it's like the, just like I was saying, whenever you do practice with anything, you get better. But where you need, you know, sometimes if you start, you know, with any practice, you start with a warm-up, right? <laughs> you have to stretch right. your legs, you have to stretch your body. Declarations right. are like a warm-up. They're not the end-all, be-all, but they're an entry point. They're like a first step, a way to get the brain going in the right direction. And then there are some, some deeper skills and some more, you know, a deeper level and more complicated skills that you then learn that basically back up the, the declarations and keep you moving. Well, this is wonderful. What, what, what a, a feeling of... of of inspiration um, for so many people to know that there's this kind of support out there. And Rachel, what you're doing 
coming from your own personal experience and journey through this, um, it, it, it's, it just goes to show that it's true that we can. We can, I don't know about overcoming, but we can work through and learn how to, to improve our own lives just, just by, by learning these skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it's an absolute honor, you know, to work with my clients. And, you know, I, I recently had a client who he, when we started, he was so frustrated with relationships. He had recently divorced and was just of the mind that, you know, relationships were just never going to work out for him. He, there was just no way it was going to happen. And he just, you know, couldn't trust. He was way too afraid of being abandoned. And, you know, now, uh, a year or so later, he's been in a year relationship, and he's moving in with her, and they're doing great. And I just love seeing those sorts of transformations in my clients, you know, them getting themselves and their lives back and are no longer, you know, burdened and stuck because of the abuse. Wow. Now, you also send out um, emails, right? I have a monthly newsletter, so um, folks can go to the website, rachelgrantcoaching.com, and on the left side, they can do a couple. There's, there's so much you can do on my website, but <laughs> they can um, sign up to re receive the newsletter on a monthly basis, so they'll be sure to know about any of my upcoming events, like the talk that's going to be happening in September, or other radio shows um, that I'm going to be appearing on, special offers that I have every once in a while. They can also uh, download an excerpt of the guidebook uh, from the website and get parts one and two of the guidebook for free. Wow. As well as I opened other... it up and I was looking at, oh, at your guidebook, and mm -hmm. I was and I was noticing that that you actually it, it's I almost want to say like a workbook. Absolutely. Like somebody so there's some spaces that I didn't get a chance to read, but you ask something and then left spaces for the person to fill out. Yeah, I wrote the guidebook with so, the intention that people could work it on their own uh, right. if they weren't able to work with me one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And so, uh, you know, I, I certainly invite any of your, uh, any of the listeners, if you, if you pick up the guidebook and you decide to work it on your own, but if you get to a section and you don't understand something or you have a question, please don't hesitate. You know, give me a call, shoot me an email. I'm happy to, you know, answer those sorts of questions um, because I want, you know, people to be able to progress through it and, and not get stuck for some reason. So, um, well, and they can, where can they purchase the the actual guidebook? You said this is an excerpt, excerpt of it. an excerpt. Uh -huh. At the end of the excerpt, there will be a link, but you can also go to Amazon. And uh, if you type in Beyond Surviving and My Name, then the book will pop up. And you can buy the paperback or the Kindle version are available. Um, oh, so, nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. That was, a, that was quite an adventure putting that putting the book together. <laughs> that was I, I, that was a lot of work, but it was it was so rewarding. And quite honestly, like this really is the program I use. Like when I'm having a day or I'm having a moment, I really do. Like I go pick up my book, and I go and I, I read something, or or do a reflection from it, and you know get myself back on track if I'm having a rough day. Well, clearly you have put a lot of work into this. Um, and I'm looking at the different parts that you have um, at the bottom where it does say uh, buy now and, and want to go further with your journey of recovery. Um, the asking for support and defining the abuse and outcomes, identifying and challenging false beliefs, emotion, sharing your story, relationships, moving on. This is, this is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I really wanted yeah. to put yeah, something we, out there that was um, e easy, accessible, doable. It's not 500 pages. You know, it's really something I think that is can be approached um, easily. Nice. Now, we have about two minutes left, and we have oh a gosh. question from the, <laughs> the chat room. Um, so, Kat, uh, someone wants to know, how do you get past not ever feeling loved? Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, in two minutes, huh? <laughs> okay, we're gonna <laughs> let's see. Well, okay. 
first of all, never feeling loved, right? So the reason why we don't express or experience love is because we have ideas or thoughts about our, our worth and our value. So what we first want to investigate is what it is about us that we believe makes us unlovable. So if we were working together, one of the things I would ask you to do is a reflection on uh, I don't deserve to be loved because or I am unlovable because. We want to first begin identifying what's going on underneath that thought and begin thinking about where those beliefs even came from. How did you even get the idea that you were maybe say worthless or not deserving or um, sometimes in the more extreme dirty or um, less than, you don't matter, those sorts of things. And you know, one of the big false beliefs that often comes about as a result of abuse is, uh, you know, there must be something wrong with me and that's why this happened to me. And oftentimes those thoughts what we end up thinking about ourselves and must have been true about us that caused us to be abused are what also caused us to think that nobody could possibly love us. And so whenever somebody starts to approach us with love, we, it's almost like we just can't tolerate it. We can't stomach it. We don't have the open space for it. So I'd love for you, first of all, thank you for your question. I'd love for you to do that reflection question and email me your answer. You can email me at coach at rachelgrantcoaching.com and we can have a quick dialogue about it and we can start taking a look at what's going on there because it's by clearing away those thoughts that you can actually then create enough room and space in your life where you can feel loved. That's excellent. Um, so oh, I hope, um, I, I hope you know you. who you are. You need to that. listen to that, okay? And you are I lovable. Hope. Well, I think that we all have have issues with that, whether we're willing to admit it or not. So I just want to say thank you for your courage for even asking that question. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, and... Rachel? Oh, go ahead, sir. I want to thank Rachel for coming on. Um, her show was amazing. There were a lot of people asking for information. So um, you'll be getting some contact with a few people. Um, I posted your contact information, email, website, and stuff in the chat room. I want to thank everyone for listening, and most of all, Rachel, for being here. Thank oh, you, Rachel. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. It really has. It's been an honor. And uh, thank you so much, and we will be in touch. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on Soul Sister Radio. Safety first is Murphy's Law. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you. Good night.